Hi everyone, thanks for watching. You can support our work on our website ageoftruth.tv and please like our videos, subscribe to our channels on YouTube, BitChute and Brideon and remember to hit the bell for notifications and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. To be sure not to miss any of our shows, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website ageoftruth.tv How's life in Denmark? Well, it's good. I mean, we have some good summer days, so uh, we, we appreciate that a lot in Denmark with the cold weather and the rain. So uh, it's been uh, the last pieces of summer, so all good so far. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the 28th of August 2023 and our special guest today is a Canadian author, philosopher and esoteric researcher in areas of simulation theory, self-observation, history and ancient wisdom. His latest book is called Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap, about the deceptive false light dimension we go to at the point of death. Howard Howdy Mikoski. Good morning and hello from Copenhagen, Denmark, and welcome to all of our viewers joining us on Age of Truth TV. Please subscribe to our channel, like our videos, and hit the bell for notifications. And a very, very warm, special welcome to our guest joining us from Trondheim, Norway. It is Canadian born author and researcher. Howard Howdy Mikoski, who has been living in Norway for the last 10 years since he moved from Canada. We are so happy to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Lucas. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, we'll see if some sort of Scandinavian knowledge flows through us today. Ex exactly. This is so interesting that you are in norway you've been there for 10 years you got married there and moved to our part of the world we are in the southern part of scandinavia here in denmark and norway is the north obviously in a very let's say long country so so it's a, it's it's kind of a very big country obviously and um you are originally from canada am i right that is it that's correct so that was my initial yeah, 40 sort of years of my life, but I've lived, as your viewers will soon find out, a very strange and odd life. And so, uh, but that strange and odd life has led me to, you know, the books I write and the things I've done. So it, it all plays a part of the package. Absolutely. And you've been researching all of these esoteric and occult topics for so many years. You are an author of quite quite a number of books, actually. Your recent book is called is entitled uh, Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap. And you talk about the soul death trap. And we've discussed that for many, many years here on Age of Truth TV and with a lot of different guests. But you've made it your specialty to go into that topic extensively in your most recent book. And that will also be our main topic tonight. You've also written a couple of other books exposing the exposition about the world's fairs and falling for truth and a couple of others. You can go into that as well later on and how people can and look into your work and maybe purchase your books 
But first of all, um, Howard, before we, uh, or howdy, I should say, hi, howdy, how, howdy, howdy, howdy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, 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 that, that's my friends call me. So there you go. That's absolutely. Your, that's your moniker today. But I'll, I'll do that. Definitely. Yeah. So before I go into my first question, please just tell people a little bit about your background and history. Uh, sure. Um, I guess I lived a semi normal life growing up in Canada. I was a hockey player and um, mostly just enjoyed life through my 20s, although I had a bit of a rebellious streak. I didn't like authority. And um, well, I didn't have a huge interest in what might be called esoteric subjects, I would go and read books like on the Bermuda Triangle or on um, th those kind of phenomena. You know, in the Charles Berlitz series, you probably remember, came out. I read all those books, but it was just on the fringe. Uh, life was still pretty good. Then uh, I had a psychopathic father who was, uh, of course, that's always challenging to live with when you have a parent who is an actual psychopath. And um, uh, my last year of university, he uh, stole all my money just before I was about to get ready to go. And so this created a giant um, overturning of my sort of my life, right? It's like I actually had to stop university for a couple of years to figure out how I would gain enough money to be able to, you know, go back and finish. So it was, so it's a combination of right at the end of your university degree, you get that chopped off. And of course, because it's coming from a parent, you get the, you know, the, the issues that are there. Um, one of uh, several traumas I've taken, uh, had in my life. I, I, I certainly have learned in the course of my life that my traumas are, you know, four out of 10 compared to what other people have gone through, but they've been an important part of, of the journey. I just want, before you go on to address what you're saying about your father being a psychopath, yeah. I mean, that is yeah. quite a very harsh uh, statement to, 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 to say there. But I mean, what, what did you experience? Yeah. Did you go through trauma because of him? Oh, sure. Um, obviously, I mean, he was, uh, the best way to describe it, he was a con man. So he was constantly, he was uh, like uh, in the accounting field and he would be constantly moving other people's money into his own accounts, right? That was kind of what he was doing. Uh, eventually wound up going to jail and, and through through this period. Um, but it was more of a sense of um, just sort of like a constant mental manipulation that would be going on. That would be the best way to describe it. So he's constantly manipulating his environment because, of course, everything is always on the edge of collapse. So he's constantly needing to manipulate everyone and everything in it to play certain games. So, and of course, um, a combination of when you grow up like that, you kind of think that's normal. You think that's how other people, that's how everyone else lives their life. But on the other hand, it does give you some abilities because you're constantly then checking other people. Like, are they lying to me? Are they not lying to me? So you, you do over time begin to get a better bullshit meter than, than you would, you know, having two wonderful loving parents who cared about you all the time and think, think to trust everybody. So like everything it's pluses and minuses, but obviously the, the the traumas that would come through and, and there's I mean there's many smaller traumas over the years I just gave the final the final last one right but it was like many over the years that of course take a long time to unravel but did um, you always have yeah. to walk on eggshells or be be afraid of his mood swings or, or did he have those was that was yeah, it that um, kind of manipulation and gaslighting and yeah yeah a lot of that kind of stuff um but he would go through the because of course as a con man you also have to you you have to provide something useful right you have to and he was a very smart guy he was very intelligent so you have this extreme intelligence with this, uh, manipulative ability but this ability to like there were other times that we had really good interactions like my mother was a my mother was a bowling champion actually so she traveled across north america as a championship bowler so while she was doing that my father would take me to museums all day or to ball games or you know i couldn't stay watching my mom bowl all day you know i i, I wished her well but you know i'm 10 years old i you know and uh, so he, so he did actually open some doorways for me in certain areas like he was willing to take me in to do things that were interesting to me. But yeah, you were always kind of playing in his world. And you kind of always had to navigate, like you say, uh, his mood to keep him uh, somewhat stable, because if he if he tripped out, of, sort of tripped out on you, uh, yeah, it, it would be very challenging. So um, 
that it, would it that takes be a while what they today to... call a narcissist i mean the, a narcissist i mean i know it's a being it's a word that they throw around a lot these days but i mean nor uh, originally a narcissist is nar narciss narcissistic personality disorder which is also linked to outgoing borderline personality disorder which is on the brink in and out of the this let's say the circle of uh, psycho psychopathy huh or was he a full blown yeah, he, psychopath? That, that, that's right. What I mean. Right. They're just they're on the edge, you know. And like so many of us today, we we flirt with that. Our whole world is set up as a narcissistic world now. Social media, everything is 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 presented now to to promote your egoic self rather than you know what you really truly feel. Or you're always wearing a mask, and so you might say that's that's the narcissistic view is wearing a very a very carefully constructed mask, and then psychopath takes it to the next level of and I'm going to get what I need from the world, and I don't care who gets hurt by it. The the narcissist, I think, contains that a little bit. But once you get moving to like where my father was moving to, like he wasn't a full blown psychopath. Like you know, don't think he killed anybody or anything. But uh, he really didn't care about other people. Let's put it that way. So um, sounds so like a was, lot of politicians was, and people in high positions huh, that sure. we have to deal with. Uh, well, every day the the population every day. Yeah. So again, I mean, by seeing that, I, I can see others in the world as as this reality exists. And in my case, I, I built I built a, a my my uh, I guess my what's the word you're looking for? Not wall, but my uh, way of navigating through that was humor. So I, I actually became a comedian for like twelve years, right? So the the dealing with the difficulty and the pain became um, became stand up comedy. And you became a uh, professional stand-up comedian, didn't you? Yeah, Work for right. quite a number of years. Would you consider that you? I mean, would you say that you had a, had considerable success, or how would you describe your career as that? No, my career was um, my career became very controlled. Um, I was in comedy really because I wanted my own TV show. That was really what I'd hoped to gain out of my comedy career. But I quickly got, I was, because of all the all the trauma, because the next trauma after my father had uh, done that, and then I finished university, is I had an ex-girlfriend get murdered. So right as I'm coming out of the one trauma, we get the next one sort of on top of it. Oh my God, so, what happened? Yeah, so I... Yeah, so I'd spun this, I'd spun a bit out of control there for a while. And and so once I moved into comedy, because I kind of wanted to get away from the world, I was kind of looking, to, I had already, see, this was a big switch. Like once, when 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 Joan died, uh, I'd still had a, a belief in the world that if you lived a certain way, if you were kind to people, if you, if you got some good education, it, that the world would work out for you. You know, and here she was, 23 years old, now she's dead. And I had to step back and realize that that story that I've been told since I was two years old can't possibly be true or she wouldn't be dead. So right away, I already began this swing of, I don't want to then follow a normal path like everyone else because I don't think it leads anywhere. I need, you know, I wasn't really, I wasn't studying deep what you would classify as spiritual work at this point, but I was because I was asking questions within myself of, why reality is the way it is, why it functions like this, why things happen the way it do. So when I moved into the comedy field, I was, of course, I really needed to support myself. So I had to start making my my career uh, one that made money as opposed to one that was ultra creative. And if you wanted to go the route I really wanted to go, you needed to show your creativity. Instead, I became a corporate comedian. So I would do a lot of um, uh, banquets and, and those kind of events, which paid well, but your box was really tight. You had to keep a large group of people who were not there to see comedians happy. And I did that till about 2005. And I just, I kind of got tired of it and I, I moved on. Wow, that's very fascinating. You must have been quite uh, inspired by George Carlin, weren't you? I mean, he's quite amazing. He 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 is, but at the time, let's say because all the things we're going to talk about in this interview were as far from my mind as possible, and in the in the mid '90s when I started my comedy, George Carlin was still mostly focused. He was just starting to move into what you might call dangerous subjects. Like he was still, he was still looking at the world through through altered eyes. You know, things about stuff and homes and you know, football and baseball. So he was. It really wasn't until about 2000 2002 that he started kind of saying, 
you know, I've got to bring my my total philosophic message to the world. So I, I think, yeah, George's last four or five years are uh, shows him to be one of the great philosophers of our time. But when I was still a comedian myself, um, I, I was still more influenced by the older comedians of the 70s. And, and again, trying to if I tried to do George Carlin type really smart stuff at the things I was doing, I would I wouldn't have got those gigs anymore. So I also had to I had to I had to be in a way that wasn't really me, if that makes sense. He's really important, though, now today. I mean, in this world of of truth and conspiracy and esoteric research about the world, I mean, he really did say some amazing things and he was pinpointing exactly to, let's say, a very mainstream audience what is going on in the world at a time when most people were not uh awake yet also in this field and um in a way i think a few comedians did that at the end of their their careers in one way or the other but he was probably the most profound profoundly uh, uh important in that in that way maybe also joan rivers yeah don't you wish he would have been alive the last three years the things he would have said about this insanity would have just been phenomenal absolutely um, Yeah, the closest we have now, I guess, would be this guy, J.P. Sears, who has that Awaken with J.P. Uh, stuff, who, who produces like little comedy sketches about all the stuff that's going on in our world. He would be the closest, of, I think, of bringing really intelligent ways of presenting these topics um, in a safe way that like the big platforms don't shut them down. As I just mentioned with Joan Rivers, who was very, very politically incorrect. I mean, what would she not have said the last three and, and more years? Yeah, so it's it's a great potential medium. But yeah, then I started to move out of that. And, um, and in uh, 1997, I, I was in a deep depression. Like, I mean, as deep as you from all of these experiences, of course, and life wasn't going well. And I, I wanted to kill myself. I felt that was the only the only out of this place was and um I just so you were suicidal I and mean, then can I just yeah. we, we didn't address yeah. the fact that you you talked about this terrible trauma of your girlfriend uh being killed what happened there just briefly I mean that sounds unbelievable if she was 23. Yeah, just uh the boyfriend at the time um that made made that choice which I'm sure he's not very happy with now and um Yeah, it was just again because when something like that happens, it's it's so shocking, it's so surprising. You're not prepared for it, you know. It was your girlfriend. Uh, well, she well we had got we had gone out many years pre we gone out a few years previously, so it was you know we weren't actually together at the time. And, oh, and it, we we had been together a very a very short period of time, but it was enough that we had stayed close friends and we we you know we shared contact and discussion and so. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I guess it was just because I, I thought so highly of her. It, I mean, obviously, anyone who gets murdered in the world, it's it's a it's a tragic thing. But somebody like this who looked like had such a a spectacular life ahead of them, I think that's what was so shocking about it. Was this is somebody who could have actually done something really positive in this reality? And okay, they're gone. So, what is this place? Right? What what is this place? And then you became, as you said suicidal you went into deep depression and you yeah. also had a near-death experience how huh? that changed everything for you yeah first yeah i came out of the uh the depression i mean i, I just i was gonna i was in the suicidal state but um i just couldn't think of a nice clean way of doing it that whoever would find the body wouldn't find a mess and i didn't want to leave somebody in that condition so in the midst of this in this uh state um a television program on Egyptian pyramid building came on and it was like an instantaneous bolt of lightning. That's the best way I can describe it. Of like, even though the program now is a Nova program, uh, this old pyramid, and I would now dispute most of everything that's in it. I hold that program in such like gratitude because it, it changed my life. It was like, when I finished watching that program, I said, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to study ancient Egypt. They have a state, there's wisdom and there's secrets there and I need to study it. And that was not something I studied in my history degree. I was much more modern. So I had to start from absolute scratch. I knew nothing about it, uh, ancient Egypt. So I had to, I went to the library. Thankfully, the second book I picked up was John Anthony West's uh, Serpent in the Sky. And once I read Serpent in the Sky and realized there's a completely different direction of studying um, ancient history, 
I was able to throw a whole lot of other books in the garbage and I just started moving in a very strong direction. So I did that for about five, six years. And I was really lucky because during that period, I started, doors started opening. So I met a, a Korean monk and I spent uh, about a half a year with him. I started, uh, got to, to meet three different native Indian medicine men. So I was spending time on the reserves with them and their sweat lodges over the course of three or four years. And what they were, what they were having to do with me was deep, intense practices. So during that time, say to 2004, we're talking about 97 to 2004, I was doing probably 14 hours a day of practice. So the the comedy gig was great at the time because I would only work Saturdays or Sundays, let's say at most. And I had the whole rest of the week for you to just do exercise. And the main exercise I was doing was testing reality. So I was constantly testing reality to find out how real it was. And of course, in all the exercises I did, it failed miserably every single time. So that's what I was doing for about an eight-year period when I wrote my first book on on the on the ancient Egyptian wisdom. And did you also go to Egypt and see the pyramids and the and the temples and Luxor and Aswan and all these places? Yeah, first I went into Mexico and had a number of very strange experiences in uh, in Mexico first. Uh, at the number of sites there. And then a few years later, made it to, to Egypt just as I was ready to finish the book. And again, the again, it's a thing where we could, we, you know, there's 10, 20 different stories of just very strange things that I began to, again, see as, as I was studying alchemy and hermeticism and, you know, pretty much any ancient text I could get a hold of, um, I would read it. It didn't matter whether it was John D or whether it was uh, Bhagavad Gita or it was uh, Corpus Hermeticum. I, I dug through it. So I was like, I was obsessed for seven or eight years just doing this work. And when I finally got to Egypt, I guess you might say, weirdly, it was the culmination of that whole period. I didn't realize it at the time. It was like that whole one cycle ended and I was ready to start a new cycle, but I didn't start the new cycle. I was kind of left for a year in this kind of um, haze. That's the best way of describing it. And um, that, that now lead to the, the death experience. You can jump in there but i just want to ask you quickly the one million dollar question before we go into to, to all of what we're going to talk about today yeah. who built the pyramids was it by with alien help was it human beings who were more let's say highly advanced than we are now with an uncalcified pineal gland that we could move objects by the power of thought and we knew how to bend uh time or space or energy use energy for also lifting uh, large heavy objects here's the now the problem so if you'd asked me this like 10 years ago i would probably have said similar things to what you had just said there which makes the most logical sense once you've seen it and experienced it and felt the energies and but now after i've gone through what i've gone through and worked on the last three or four years I now have to start wondering now when you know that this is a simulation, that this is not a reality like we've come to know it is. So being a simulation, it must, it had a start point. All simulations or computer games, they start at a particular date. So, so to answer your question simply, until we know the date that this simulation started, that's a question we can't even answer. Because if this simulation, let's say started uh, June the 1st, 1814, let's say as an example, then the answer would be nobody built the pyramids because the pyramids would come from the previous simulation that were in a sense coded into this one to make us think we we were we've been having this continuous one reality when we according to a lot of ancient texts we've had multiple resets multiple restarts multiple one simulation gets shut down a new one starts so this could become an answer to this very age old question when we've tried to answer these these old um these old questions about things in our past is we, I think the first question has to be, can we verify that it's from this particular simulation that we've known since at least we were born? If so, then maybe we can find an answer. If not, we may never find an answer. And that would bizarrely be the answer. This is exactly my first question. You're right on the mark. This is so it's funny. So you're going directly into it, you know, because I was going to say, are we living in a simulation, like yeah. a sophisticated uh, holographic illusion, a computer game, you just said that highly advanced, yeah. is the whole thing steered by AI in a way? Or how did this whole 
let's say illus illusory um frequency we are on a frequency i guess how how did this illusion who created it yeah so what do you think should i answer that one first or should we hold on and bring us up to date in the history which what which way do you want to go well that you're, is you're that, that, well i just wanted to because it was kind of interesting that you already okay. went into where we're going but of course sure. uh, if you address this one because we, we stay on this topic now then please uh, go into how you had the near death experience and then we can th th then we sure. can continue from from there is that okay sure sure of course uh um you know one of the things i like is i i know i know your channel and lucas for people who don't know i've i've seen his his work here before and, and he is a great interviewer so that's one of the reasons i was really looking forward to coming on with you today was that he, you're always prepared and the questions are good and and um yeah so thank you um you're welcome. Um, so I guess one of the things, of course, we all, to really ask, of course, people have to step back because everything I'm going to say in our time together is it's always it's a thesis. It's my opinions based on the 25 years of experience and the research I've done and the things uh, things I've gone. And so everything I'm saying, I, I want to make sure that people don't instantly believe it because I'm saying it and I but don't disbelieve it either. It's the, really I hope what I'm sharing in through my books and my work is the ability for people to think deeply and ask deep questions and maybe go into areas they don't normally think about or go into. Uh, maybe you reject it in a day, but it's a time to think about it. So I just want to throw that out at the beginning. So the, the first question would be, how would we know we are in a simulation? Uh, how could we test the difference between reality and simulation? And and so that, that's that been part of a question for me for, for, for 10 years. So part of it links back to this this period I was talking about before 2004 when I was testing reality. And when it got to the point that reality was transparent, that it was literally non -so not solid. Um, and it got to the point through the through the hard practices that I did, uh, like I did recapitulate. I recapitulated my whole life over four years. I was doing intense, not doing practices, dreaming practices, uh, the things in the sweat lodge, the things Mr. Park had me doing. And it got to the point where I had to actually hold on to a chair when I was sitting down to make sure it was going to be there. Like literally reality was at the point of just non-solidity. Um, a uh, story I like to tell was I was at a girlfriend's house at the time and I told her, oh yeah, your sister's coming over now. I said, what do you mean? Your sister's coming over. And all of a sudden there's a knock at the door. So she gets up and lets her in and said, because uh, we're, we're just watching TV. And she's like, how did you know my sister was coming? I said, well, I saw her park. She parked her car and she got out. She walked up to the door. And then she looks at me and goes, but how did, that's a wall. And it's it's like we're, the TV was facing a wall leading out to the road. There's no windows. There's no nothing. Just a wall. But to me, the wall wasn't there. I was literally, while she was saying that, I was just seeing directly outside. And when she told me it's a wall, the wall reformed back in and the wall showed up again really you could see through the walls it was amazing yeah huh? yeah. Mm. yeah well it was amazing and it was quite terrifying at the same time because had you been taking a lot a, a, a lot of drugs with those people you met those indian people because i do Zero. know that that a lot of people have their have these mind expanding experiences and and, and no i want to make sure that i'm very clear with that too that i've taken none I had one drug experience actually by accident in 1994 when I was in uh, when I was traveling. Other than that, from the time I started, I made sure I stayed away from all of it completely because uh, I didn't want to be influenced by any outside source to any experience I was going to have. So the natives I was with were very clear with teaching me how to have altered states of consciousness uh, by creating it yourself. Now that, that and, I'm, I must just say this because I think it's so important. Because a lot of people have it because of taking different mind expanding drugs. And it can be maybe good for some people and it's bad for some other people. But this is such an important thing to address that this can happen to people if they go in the right direction, if they're open to it. And it's it's very inspiring to hear that you had that uh, without all of those things. Yeah, thank you. And it's it's uh, the way I like to share it is while the drug can do things, and like you say, there can be times for certain people it can have a value. The problem is, is you might say the drug is in control. The drug is going to be in control of the experience. And 
anyone who's, and I was an alcoholic for several years. So um, back in, in the nineties, I was also an alcoholic through that. And anyone who's been on any kind of addiction knows that the, whatever it is you're using gives you something, but it demands something in return. And often what that is demanding is far greater than what you get. And sometimes once you're, once you're in too deep, it's, it's, it's hard to, even though, you know, it's taking more than it's giving, it's hard to get out of it. So yeah, that was why for me, I was so thankful that the people who had been uh, helping me early in the, in the, in the stages of this were, you know, it's, it's harder, it's more work, it takes longer, but in a sense, I'm always in control. Like if I was going on some sort of um, journey or, or moving into an alternate reality, if I didn't like something, well, I just came right back. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't with something else. So, um, so that's something I always try to share with people that if you're interested in these, in these subjects, uh, try to do it without, without uh, other substances, because it, it, you, you will have much, much better control of the whole experience and you can do it anytime you want. Yeah, very fascinating. And what about the, you say that you were an alcoholic, how much was that daily? And how much would you say? I mean, just briefly? Well, probably like, no different than any other hockey player or any other top athlete in the world would be drinking. Let's just, you know, because of the stress of the, of the situation and the team camaraderie and, and uh, that was a big part of it. Um, And it was also a big part of it of sort of a shyness around women that if I was going out, this helped me. Uh, I felt anyway, it helped me um, break some of the shyness. But one day I was reading a, um, I was reading a magazine, something about here's how you uh, determine if you're an alcoholic. And I read, I I took the test and I was like, that seems like me. And I'm like, I I don't think so. I mean, every, everybody I know is, you know, it's say I would go out, I'd have seven or eight drinks or something and you know, whatever. Not, not not overly over the top, but from the test I read, it told me I'm an alcoholic. So I had this in the back of my mind. I was working with the Korean monk then. And one day I was with Mr. Park and he was doing this cupping te- uh, cupping techniques, which I'm sure you're aware of is like a, a an, an Asian uh, thing where cups are placed on your back and, and it says poisons are drawn onto your body. Yeah. But most, most, most practitioners use two or three. Mr. Park would use 60 or 70 at a time. So you're literally, your body would be covered with like felt like you're on fire and when they were all when they'd come off he would talk to you about what each of the cup marks meant and then one day he just says to me oh you uh why you drink so much you're gonna get liver cancer and die and then he got up and he left and i had to start thinking liver cancer and die and but he's and i thought but he's been right about everything he's ever said to me before i think i better stop and that was like i literally stopped like the next day that was just i'm done and now it's been 25 years i drink a little bit of like uh like a bitter uh like i guess where you're from it'd be something like a gamel dansk uh i drink some other <laughs> stuff just as like a, a digestive as i'm you know i'm in my 50s now so the the stomach needs a little but that's it mm. but but i i got to the point where like i am able to have a drink anytime i want so i i i I was, I tested it about three or four years later as I was doing all my work. And this is one of the things I worked on was why I was drinking. What were the inner, what was the inner reasons for doing it? What did I think I was gaining from it? And so it was a practice. And I eventually I got to the point where I said, okay, I think I understand why I was drinking. So I went people drink a lot in Norway, like in Denmark. I mean, there's always a party here. Every time people, I mean, I guess everybody is more or less what you would call an alcoholic because everybody's having a good time. And when they're together, which is a lot here in this country, you know, there's a drink and whatnot, maybe not a lot, but just, you know, to hang out. If someone's having one or even two, that's not anywhere close to alcoholism, right? Because actually alcohol in its original form is a medicine. Right. Like I say, if you take small amounts of certain things, it's actually it's it was made by the monks. It was, you know, many and created in 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 the in ancient Egypt and other places. It's it's an actual medicine. It's when you take it to bigger and bigger uh, pushes, then it becomes because it's its secondary name is it's a spirit. That's the name of one of the things. Spirits. It's opening doorways. And like many of these things, it's opening doorways. And if you're not if you're not aware of what's happening when you open these doorways, stuff is going to come in that you really don't want to deal with. And actually, 
if I look back on things now, it's probably not even the alcohol per se that was the problem. It was the doorways that the alcohol opened to energies and and, and influences that I that were just not good for me. That it wasn't even getting rid of the alcohol that was the, that changed my life. You might say it was closing doorways to negative influences that the alcohol connects to. Yeah, and these bad spirits, call them ar- archons, jinns, demons, whatever, mm-hmm. they will inhabit or jump into the human body where they can, right, and feed on right. our angst and fear and a- anxiety and, and and whatever we have, all the all the low vibrating energies there. And that's that that is also that will eventually lead us into the whole soul trap that we're going to discuss as well. But just to get uh, up to date with where you got to where you are now, we didn't hear about your near death experience. Right. Right. So by the time I hit 2005, I finished the the work with the the Egyptian um, texts, and I was I was doing pretty good at that point. But I attest reality now was was false but I was still real. So that's where I'd gotten to, you know, reality's fake, but I'm real. Uh, then I fell into a, a river near a canyon, uh, just a very stupid mistake, slipped in uh, right near a waterfall in, uh, in uh, John, they call Johnson Canyon in uh, the Rocky Mountains. Well, I think the largest waterfall in Canada. And I fell in just in front of it. I didn't know it was there, actually. I just slipped in. And at, once I was in the water, I realized that's where I'm heading. And while I was in the water, I realized, oh, this is where I'm going to die. This is, you know, we're all going to die and it's going to happen to me now. And uh, there was a, a tremendous acceptance in the experience. There was a tremendous acceptance of it's okay. You know, I, I don't need to keep living. There's nothing more I need to do. It's fine. And uh, I'm just going to, it's like I'm going to front row seats to watch my death. Once I come to that acceptance, everything I could think of as me just dissolved. Thoughts, emotions, memories, experiences, fears, hopes. It was all just gone. And all that was left, I would classify as like a a witnessing awareness, but not a witnessing awareness like we would normally think. Like sometimes we can get to the point where in good meditation, I can see my thoughts, you know, oh, well, I can, then I'm not my thoughts because I can see them. You're at this, you're at this deeper point. Well, I was at a point where I could even see the thing that was seeing the thoughts, you know, like I, I was at this very deep point of awareness. And there was there was no thinking going on. All there would be was be bubbles of information. So this massive amount of information would come up in front of me like a cluster. It would explode, and it would be fully understood. Whatever was in this cluster was like completely understood. And then the next cluster would come, and the next cluster. So this was all happening in like a second of 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 things that were going on. So I was getting this this realization that everything I'd ever thought was me was false. That I was, oh yeah. I'm as fake as reality. That's one of the big things that came out of the experience. It was like, yeah, me and reality are both fake. We are both just masks that something much deeper is wearing. And um, I was at the point where I was getting close to going over the falls and a friend of mine had fallen in at the same time. I actually pulled him in. He, I tried to get out and I, I pulled him in actually. So he was in also. And I, 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 a, a cluster came up that kind of said, well, if I don't get out, how is my friend going to get out? And at that point, I hit a my um, with my because I by the now instead of swimming this way, I was kind of upright, and I hit a boulder. I deflected off to the right and uh, made it to the shore. And just as I was crawling out, I was yelling to my friend, "Like it's shallow, you can get out here." And he got out himself. We sat for a while. We didn't say much. We just watched the water, and then we shared our experiences because they were detailed experiences, and they were very similar. He had also gone through an experience of accepting being dead, and and this and what had come into his acceptance. Um, so from the next, like, say, three to six months, I had this friend who to help me go through, because sometimes the aftermath of that experience was extreme clarity, like extreme clarity. And a lot of the book Falling for Truth, which came out of that experience, comes from this clarity. But there was also at times tremendous confusion. And we can also talk in, in, in later on of, of how such a how such a death experience creates as much confusion as it does clarity. And I unfortunately lived through that confusion for a good 10 years. And it's only been in the last four or five years that I've fully begun to integrate that death experience into what's here now. And, and hopefully what I'm, maybe a lot of what I'm sharing isn't that much different than I might've shared 10 or 15 years ago. But my hope is now by coming to a more integration of all of that, um, I'm in a much more uh, grounded and relaxed and, and balanced place as I talk about all of this with everyone. So, 
It's it's been a long Did journey. You feel that it was a holographic simulation that you were in. Did you feel that that this? I mean, you you had already had those experiences, but knowing that you were about to die and knowing that actually you could all you also had the the possibility to change all all of your I mean change your destiny in a way and go on. Did you feel it was a choice? Did you were you away? I mean, let's say, did you leave mm -hmm. the body at any time? Um, no, not like the way we would hear standard near death experiences. There was never actually. I, I have had out of body experiences, so I, I've had I have had those. Um, but this was different. I, I, I in a sense consciousness. In a sense, what happened was is the was the awareness that I wasn't the body at all. So I, it's like I didn't have to leave the body because I wasn't actually in it or or a body. I would just happen to be viewing it from the eyes of the thing that was in the water, if I could say it that way. And also your question of it being holographic is very, very important because that's one of the big places of confusion where I got. And if I could explain it to the viewers, it was that the the it's like in the experience, a light shone on like this part of the screen. So I saw this part of reality, total, perfect, and complete. The problem is because everything is holographic, I thought I got the light on all of reality. So you come out of that thinking you know everything when actually you kind of saw a little bit of everything, but you only saw a, 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 a bit of, of the everything completely. And that's where the confusion begins to start because then the egoic self that's not fully, you know, not fully gone through in the experience will reorganize itself on this ability that, well, now you, now you, you've seen everything. So you, now, you know, and I got trapped in that for quite a while. And it took, it took some time to actually come out and begin to really start analyzing well what can i say I, I know for sure what is something i can say i don't know and what are things that i can say maybe here's an opinion and and that was a big part of the process was was um just getting comfortable then with with what the experience did show and what it didn't show so that holographic idea is it, it's very tricky because anytime you get something like that you seem like you get everything but you really didn't so in what way do you connect that to what I asked about the pyramids that maybe they were not built or they will be, uh, they were built in another simulation from the past or the present or I guess everything is happening at the same time right because time doesn't really right. exist so everything ha happens simultaneously here but i mean how can that even how can you explain this in order for people to understand what you mean yeah i don't know it's it's just this sense of once i once i began to get the recognition because when i worked on the world fairs book which is where i wound up next which was writing that in 2019 before all this stupidity started i wrote that in early 2019 uh, i had been in florida i will answer your question lucas just so you know um and I was in Florence uh, on, a, on a little bit of a trip, but I was studying cathedrals. I was studying cathedrals to see how they could be uh, energetic machines. And when I came back and I bumped into these world fairs, which I, I found to be just insane, like there, there's there's no there's no part of a history or history I think that's any more insane than the world fairs of the 1800s, right? Where they built these giant 700 acre sites, supposedly in record time, with massive buildings of marble and stone and then as soon as they were done took dynamite and blew them all up you know it, it, the story of them is just insane and i started using the term reset in the book because that was starting to be used in the alternative community about seven or eight years ago that we that this this world has gone through times where it's literally been torn to pieces that would be what the flood myth would be it would be the equivalent of a reset where everything is wiped out you might say and then it's, things are restarted and that all of a sudden went in 2020, and that word started to be used by all of our supposed wonderful leaders of the world that we're now getting ready for a new reset, I started realizing how correct I probably was with explaining that this time of the world fairs in the late 1800s was coming out of the last reset. And well, then there's been others in the past. And the, the the change started to come when I finally answer your question is when I started realizing that it's not just one reality that gets like cleaned up and cleaned like or cleaned up, rechanged. And when it's literally ended, you literally end a simulation and start a brand new one. And the best way to start the new one is to take the remnants of the old one, model the new one on it, 
and go forward with that. So similar to like Westworld, where a robot in Westworld will think they have this giant thing known as a backstory, right? They've really started on day one of the park, but they think they've had a time ever since they were a small child and they have all these memories and all these stories, but none of it really happened to the robot in Westworld. It's just a story that's been implanted. So I think when we start looking at deeper and deeper things in our past, there's a truth to them. There's a truth to all those events. It's not like a complete lie. The problem is the truth is in a different simulation. And that's why it's so hard to track down. So someone wants to say track down the Jesus story uh, completely. Well, if you're trying to track it through this simulation, you won't get the answer. But if you realize that's from a different simulation, therefore a completely different uh, series of of everything, frequencies completely, it would have been a completely different reality, then these things can start to be explained and can start to be potentially brought back into how can we use those stories or that information in this world. Like, for example, I would say how the pyramids were built now to me are less of an important question as opposed to the energies that exist in them today or stone circles. We live here in Scandinavia, and this this is a place that's, we're loaded with ancient stone circles everywhere, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, I mean, they're everywhere, and they're, and they're still strong, they're still crisp. So my question would be not, how were they built, even why they were built, it's how can we use them now? How can we go to these ancient sites, tap into them and do something positive in our own transformation of the work we're doing? That, I think, becomes the most important question. And if you ever can answer the other ones on the, at the same time, bonus. But it's so, like so that, so be that would question. be to draw energy uh, from the ether at these stone circles or these specific places that they used for that, and and that's what you mean. Like the pyramids, we know were used as energy centers, right? To draw energy, to tap into what is already there, uh, free energy, really, huh? Yeah, again, that's the, that's so challenging because, again, we're trying to answer questions about how this simulation is structured with things that were originally built in another simulation. So when you becomes, say simulation, Howdy, is that, yeah. do you mean a parallel dimension, a parallel universe in a way, not this one? I mean, like, literally a separate computer program. So when you asked in your initial question, like, is this AI? Well, when I go through the Gnostic texts of the Nag Hammadi and I tran retranslate those, or when I go through uh, the uh, work of the Cathars or, or ancient tradition, and they're very clear that they're they're calling this a type of simulation right from the ancient text, and therefore a simulation is is a non true is a non truthful experience and built by AI. So. We so it could, would be and it's, and it's like, if I say it in a primitive way, it would be like yeah. on a computer on your desktop and you look at your screen, you have different folders and you can open that folder. That's one simulation. Pyramids were built, whatever. And this is the, the simulation of today or the now. And you can take some things from that folder and put it into that folder, and then it exists simultaneously. Is that can can I say it like that? Similar. I would maybe describe it best as like in the, what you saw in the movie Thirteenth Floor, where you had the com the computer programmers building a simulation of 1930s Los Angeles in in their computer simulation so there to them there was a 1930s Los Angeles that they modeled it on and then they built it in the computer uh their version of it so it's not it no matter how much how well they did it it couldn't possibly have been 1930s Los Angeles but it was their version of it um, as correct as they could get. And that's kind of how I would describe it. So like you had the old folder of one simulation and then, well, we're done with this one. We're making a new one. Um, and they would rebuild, they would re rebuild one from the other, but make certain changes because your, your point of energy, I think is very important. Getting back to my whole reason of why we think what, what this whole, whole thing is, is that we, in a sense, we, as in souls, divine, not soul, divine sparks that are here, we are here to power the simulation that in a sense we are, th th this is the ingenious thing. The, the craftsmen of this simulation built what I call, you know, Plato's cave or the matrix. It's vast. It's an absolutely, yeah, the, the, all the dimensions, all the possible realms, all the possible simulations, it's vast. And it requires a huge power source. Think of the power if that was, if that was real computers, that it would be to require to, to power all of this. 
it's ingenious if you could then get the characters you put in your video game to be the power source to run your entire simulation. And I think that's what's happened. And as time goes, as, as the simulation continues to grow, and there's reasons why the simulation doesn't stay static, why it grows, it gets to a point where it, it's no longer able to, the, we are no longer able to power it based on the way it's been structured. And I think it comes, the AI itself decides, I've got to shut the simulation down, move them all into a new one with different energy structures. And it, it's if we think of the different simulations as different ways of extracting energy, then I think we understand what was there and potentially what we, us, whoever, whatever we are, we're in them to try to get around that. But if the but if the pyramids and well in Egypt and Stonehenge, whatever was built in another simulation and put into this one, uh, why are they incomplete? Why are stones missing? Why do they look old and and a little bit worn out and I don't know, very, very ancient, obviously. Why didn't they just create them new and fresh and beautiful and with the golden thing on top and yeah, and when whatever they said was the original form? Good question. That might be, um, we might, and again, this is just the theory, this is just my opinion. Uh, I, I would maybe take this two directions. One would be, let's say this, this simulation started in the 1800s. Well, you couldn't have ancient history and try to claim that it goes back five, 10,000 years and have the pyramids look brand new, right? You would have to, one, one sense, you'd have to make sure they were old. Another possibility is if you do study these sites, these, these sites, especially the oldest ones, when you're looking at, you know, Giza and Dashur and Abu Sir and even Teotihuacan and and whatnot, show signs of, of serious um, damage, like as if they've been hit by rockets, uh, plasma bursts, or whatever. So you've also got this possibility that maybe what what, do, what you're seeing is the the way the pyramids were brought in is the way they ended the last simulation and perhaps the, la the, the last simulation for them. Because we don't know that the pyramids were necessarily the last one. They could be two, three, four simulations back. We don't know how many how many simulations back they go, for example. But it seems like there was a – certainly it looks like fire. Like uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Abu Sir, but there's there's parts of Abu Sir where the granite, some of the inner parts of the temples has been melted. Now – I don't know if, if you guys know how, how hot you have to get granite to actually melt it. And what's bizarre is on the outside of it will still be limestone. So the And the limestone is not melted, which is a much softer rock. The limestone is still fine, but some of the granite on the inside has melted as if inside of the temple itself is what's caused the burning mechanism that in like burn in many cases outward, not inward. So it's very, very weird when you begin to, to examine all of this because the, the on the site examination does not in any way match the stories that archeology span tries to tell us about these sites. Now that I put in this simulation theory and the possibility of multiple simulations, it at least gives more options to try to explain these anomalies. But even then I don't have answers that I, I would feel I would want to, you know, but couldn't a simulation, uh, one individual's simulation, be be like a manifestation of a very long timeline? So that we have ancient history, we have recent history, and uh, you know the, the Middle Ages and ancient Egypt and ancient Greek and all of that. So that it, it's not just a new thing pretending to be old. If you understand what I mean. Totally understand. And there's so many layers to this. Like you could also say it in such a way like you and I are also having our own personal simulation within the simulation. So there could not, there might not be one simulation. There might be 8 billion and maybe all the animals are having their own simulation and the trees are having their own simulation. One of the things that came out of the work is I don't, I don't see nature or the things in it as any different from me. We're all in a place that's suffering. We're all in a place of difficulty. We're all in a place of confusion. And each each in its own way is going through its own way of experiencing and perceiving this simulated realm. So I no longer and, and I no longer think like I know more than the tree does, or I know more than the rock does, or I know more than the bird does. We're all we're all kind of so we all might be having as well our own individual simulations in a more bigger simulation. Plato's cave is vast. And the layers of deception in this place are 
beyond what I ever thought it might be. That that would be, if I had to describe this world, it'd be two Ds, deception and distraction. Those are the two words I think that describe it perfectly. Absolutely. Deception, distraction, and, and also, well, destruction, right? So it's very interesting when you look at nature, it's it certainly seems like a simulation as well. Like the animal kingdom has been programmed to, you know, eat each other, be predators, to um, be extremely violent. And uh, that instinct is like a program, part of this computer game uh, that we are all in here. And of course, they're not civilized and the the animals don't think in that way that humans do not that that's uh, better or worse because uh, humans certainly have a very very violent mind and we are the worst predators but it there are certain uh, animals where you you just don't understand how they can do certain things like a a caterpillar or a larvae who is a big larvae and maybe it's before it becomes a huge butterfly or something they can actually change form from and they can change the shape shift into looking like a cobra a cobra snake with the eyes those eyes that you see on the on the back side of the cobra a larvae can change into that in order to distract predators from not getting eaten so that they will be fearful when they see this this huge larvae how could they know how to look like a cobra? How, wh where is that awareness? Where is the, how could that change over time in nature um, just naturally? I mean, that alone is just one example of, and also a, a chameleon who changes form according to nature. But I mean, there are so many things that are obscurely... Um, eye-opening when you really really start thinking about it what are your thoughts about that yeah these are these to me are all examples of the vastness of, of a simulation that there's there, there's too many there's too many variables to have this stuff by accident it, it seems pretty clearly it's been coded and certainly when we get back to like you're talking about the code of nature i mean just like you i'm sure i love going out into nature and being enjoying the stillness and the quiet. It's a very important place of recharging and re-energizing re the battery. But I also know that nature is a slaughterhouse. Everything out there is trying to eat something all the time. You know, how many worms have just died in the last minute to feed all the birds, um, you know? And so when we begin to think of the, of the, that the way this entire place has been structured, where something has to eat something else, something has to prey on something else in order to survive, that's where I step back and say, well, if a truly loving God created this place, this is not the kind of place they would create. Just, there's no way. The, so, and that's the fundamental belief we get as a young child, right? Loving God cares about us, creates a world for us to grow, for us to learn, for us to expand ourselves, have some experiences, have some tough challenges, but then we grow and we, we regain and connect back with this loving God again. That's the story we get. But now after all these years of work, I now probably agree more with the Gnostics or, or the Cathars that this, this particular world has an artificial simulation made by a, an evil deity known as a demiurge to the Gnostics or Rex Mundi to the Cathars, uh, built it as a pit of suffering uh, with some sneaky ways of providing some pleasure in the middle of it so you don't even know you're totally in a pit of suffering all the time. And designed so that we can be batteries of energy to keep the system running. Um, and yeah, to them, well, as far actually, as I've I, met... I, I did actually have a question for you here where, yep. where well, you've just said it again, as a, you've called the system a slaughterhouse. And the, the creator of this realm has created a place of suffering, a planet where people suffer every day. But why did this creator, we, you've already addressed it basically, create a place, a playground for the suffering um, when that creator could have created a place of bliss, peace, prosperity, 
and love. And if you say that this whole simulation is hijacked or created by the so-called demiurge, how could this even happen? Why, why does it happen? Why are we here? And of course, the next question will be, how can we get out? Yeah. So it's interesting because like you said, th th this, this is not a new topic, right? People have discussed this for 20, 30 years going back in time. Uh, it just seems like though in the last few years, for some reason, it's picking up steam. And of course, if somebody's had a really good life, and there are a few people that have been blessed with wonderful parents and doors have opened for them, life's been pretty easy, you know, no one's really got sick in their world, they would think the conversation we're having is crazy. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Life is fantastic. Everything here is wonderful. Uh, but for me, even for those people that are having that, there are billions right now suffering immensely in, in extreme suffering. And then you add the suffering of animals and the suffering of nature and the suffering. And so to me, as long as one thing is suffering here, yeah, th th there's a problem with this reality right away. There's a problem with it. And we have to, if you're honest, you'll start asking questions of where. So to simplify your answer, to simplify the question, I would leave it as this. The Gnostics explained that there were two different creations. There are two different creators. So that there's a, what they claimed as like a, a, a father type figure who had a, a female counterpart. They called it Barbello in the Gnostic text. And they created a, we'll call it a unified or totality realm in their mythology. And I'm really simplifying. I know you had John Lash on like a little while ago, and, and he can go into more detail on the Sophia myth specifically, but that Sophia decided or, or the myth tried to create on her own and created an offspring that was then not part of this totality. And this, this false creator created its own realm and it created its own realm in a place of the universe that you might call was devoid of life was dead. And in that, the, in that uh, creation space, the place we know of as play, our, our cave, Plato's cave of, of the matrix created things, but the things didn't live. He couldn't get the things to live. And so depending on the text, depending on the, on the um, translation, some will say he tricked divine sparks, parts of this original creation in here, or uh, invited us in, in freely to please come and help me. And some of us came in to help. But at some point in time, I think what happened is because this place was so sick, as the Demiurge got deeper and deeper and deeper into the simulation, it's like he picked up a virus. That's the best way I could just, just picked up a computer virus. And maybe the Demiurge wasn't completely evil to start with, but became so. And at some point in time decided, I can't let the divine sparks leave because then this place will have no life. And if it has no life, it ends. So shut the door that I think was at one time open. I think divine sparks could go in and out completely anytime we wanted. Shut this off and began the process of dropping us deeper and deeper and deeper. Into but how matter. can that happen? That's my too. simplified answer. Yeah, yeah. But how can that even happen that you say, oh, they catching a, well, that a virus, but I mean, uh, that so that the computer program changed, but how can that even happen? Because mm -hmm. if it's steered by AI or a divine source, energy, God, whatever, what have you, why would that why would that why would it be possible to create a negative realm for for destruction and for power hungry entities to control a whole population and so many uh, soul beings yeah. on this planet yeah these are and these are these are the kind of questions that i hope people would ask themselves these are very powerful questions that start to move you one way or another into uncovering deep truths and the things we're talking about are not somebody said this is really negative discussion it's not it's very very positive because it will eventually take you to the deepest core of who and what you are one way or another so it's you a very have to put powerful spotlight conversation into the darkness you know yeah you right. have to address yeah. if you the can't darkness. Stand, yeah if you, if you if you're not comfortable standing in the darkness like you say yeah you'll never stand in the light and so uh it's important to have these discussions and so and again, all, all we can pull out in, in this case is, well, what text, what ancient texts do we have who at least are closer to the original creation than, than we do? And if you start to think of it this way, when you're reading creation mythology, you're reading about two creations at the same time that get mixed together. Sometimes you're talking about the original creation of totality that will be presented as good in a wonderful light. And we have this creation of reality, which is not the same. It's it's a, it will call it a, 
improper creation is the best way to describe it. The only way I could say that to answer your question would be that it seems like the texts indicate that where the demiurge in the totality of reality picked to start creating its realm was, uh, I guess they, there was like one place that was dead. And I think that makes it into the the um, Adam and Eve story, which the, the God said, you can eat from any of the trees, but the one of uh, the knowledge of good and evil, good and evil being duality, meaning life and death, when all of the other trees would only have life. And to me, that's what the, if, if you go through it carefully and read the, the story, particularly in the Apocryphon of John, that's the most uh, most detailed version of the creation, so also in the Gospel of Judas. And if you read through those two, you'll see that first the Demiurge seemed to get in and then began to alter itself into a form of, they call it like a form of lion or a form of serpent. And in that serpent began the coiling mechanism. And in the coiling mechanism, that's where the duality comes from. Because as the serpent moves, it's constantly moving between one thing and another thing. And there there becomes the, there becomes the trap. And to me, that that is the trap. And it's not the way people think it is. People think duality, oh, up, down, left, right, good, bad, you know, I, I kind of get it, you know, it's, but what you don't get is it doesn't matter which side of it you're on, you're in it. It doesn't matter if you're on the evil side or the good side, you're in it. The unbelievable challenge is how could you go in the exact midpoint of both? Because if we took two magnets and you just place them on a table, in between those two magnets, it'll be so powerful that it could suspend a piece of metal indefinitely, forever. But it has to be in the exact midpoint. If it's one side or the other, the magnet will pull it towards it. And that's what's always happening with us. We're always moving to one side of the midpoint, so we're being drawn to one side or the other. Uh, and, and the simulation doesn't care. It doesn't matter whether you choose left, right, male, female, up, down, good, bad. It's, it just cares you've chosen something. How do we move ourselves into this absolute midpoint which a great teacher I, I really enjoyed called Richard Rose called the point of betweenness. You are between everything then. And to me, that is one of the most important ways of beginning to back yourself out of the simulation, which is realizing that it doesn't matter which side you choose, you're in it. As soon as you've chosen, you're here. Just like Adam and Eve, they chose and they're in. The way out is in a sense to unchoose the duality. We also know the depiction of the yin yang, and sometimes they have that there's a little dot in the middle. I don't know if it's a lotus flower, whatever it is, a mark in, in between the, the yin and the yang. Sometimes you, you you see that. And that might that right. might explain exactly what you're saying there. But we do we are in a simulation or in a world of duality. Everything is black, white, yin, yang, male, female, darkness, light, and all of that. And mm -hmm. that is the only way that we can experience the world, right? I mean, we cannot uh, live, breathe, or know this know the sensation of love and happiness if we haven't experienced the darkness and 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 the the let's say the sinister part of that energy that that we are part of, huh? Well, well, I would say both are still part of the simulation. It doesn't matter which side you're on, yet one side feels better than another side, of course. You know, if I meet somebody, I'd rather get a hug than a, take a brick to the side of the head. But so are you saying are... that it's okay to be in the darkness, like for the elitist, no. top elitist steering this world and, and controlling us, deceiving us with, with the, the political schemes and the mon monetary systems and health and whatnot, well, everything no, basically? Not necessarily, because again, now we're talking about how to get out of the trap, and getting out of the trap requires requires seeing all the layers of deception. And one of the great deceptions that you're, we seem to get is layered upon us of all the guilt, shame, and regret that we take through our life. So every time we do something that can possibly layer guilt or shame upon us in the after-death state, that's going to be thrown at us as a trick, and most of us will will cave in and say, yeah, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not perfect enough. I haven't evolved enough. I need to come back and learn. I need to have more love. I need to whatever. So the more negative you do is just going to build up more possibilities for guilt and shame to trap you on the other side. But when what talk, about all the negative about... stuff you believe on this planet while you're here, listening to the media yeah. and the politicians and all of that, and it's going really bad at the moment, right? 
So, I mean, do they have to make it really bad for you to wake up, for you to understand it, for you to take a stand, for you to under, to to know that you have the power within you to say no and go in another direction, to stand in your own light and say, I'm not, I am not complying to this, but you have to wake up to it. So, Most people are not awakened, even though right. there is a mass yeah. awakening going on at the moment. So there's a really powerful set of questions here, and I want to make sure I get to to all of them. I wrote them, I wrote pieces of them down because this this is really important, and this is like the bulk, I guess, of what my book is kind of trying to say at some point. So one of them is the to me is the goal of our existence now in the simulation should be ultimate freedom, and ultimate freedom, of course, can only be and only appear outside the simulation, a place I call home. A place I call back where we originate from. But as we're in the simulation, we are preparing ourselves for that journey, for the possibility of that journey. So if we give up ultimate, if we give up relative freedom in an artificial simulation, there's no way we can ever gain absolute freedom. If we have no courage here, we'll never have ultimate courage. If we never have friendship here. We can never have ultimate friendship. So if you think of all of these things as building block tests for something that's much, much greater, then I think you can understand our process of what we're doing here. I, I like to say, as the world gets more insane, our great task is to become even more, even more, even more sane. So how if you're not come... brave here, howdy. And if you don't stand yeah. your own truth and have courage to say no, and dare to go against the stream and dare to go against what is the official narrative and stand in your own truth, maybe even alone or with, with just a small group of people, you would never have the courage as a soul frequency to say no, to go into the tunnel of light, see the live review, all of those, right. the, that, that fourth dimension possibly that was created also as a deception by these archon beings. And we're going to address that as well. Is that what you mean? Yep. 100%. That it's the recognition of a, a huge uh, part of this deception, like you say, that's been built from the Demiurge through its archons, through the building of the simulation, is taking away the actual power that we have. And a great way of taking away the power that we have is thinking others have to tell us what to do, and we should, and we should make sure that everyone likes us. That's an important one. We need to make sure we're liked, as opposed to learning to be comfortable of this is how I see things, this is how I believe them, and comfortable sharing them and acting and acting it. That's an important one. Anybody can say something, but then when it comes time to act, they don't do it. So the acting part of it, the actual, the actual becoming that which you say you are or want to be is a really important part of the journey. Uh, you don't you don't ever find truth. You become it. And you, you you live it in in every moment of your life. And that's a lot of one section of one of the things you were bringing up in that comment, which is it's all about what you're doing here is preparing your, yeah, it's preparing these deep levels of your awareness to be ready for the big challenges that you would get if you actually want to leave the matrix. So that was the first one I got. The second one was... Um, you were talking about the ones who actually run this place and who are of extreme darkness, and that is very true. And the question is, well, some like, well, why? Why? Why do? Why are they so dark? Why is it so? Why do they produce such an evil uh, place? If we think of it though that they are, you might say, either archons directly in in uh, human bodies, or you could say they are closely connected to these archonic being archons being levels down of the demiurge who you might say are run run the show for it they're you know mr smith's in the matrix kind of uh terminology if if what i believe is true that our simulation is about to end that we are coming to the end of of this current simulation and everything that's going on is not about this simulation it's preparing the next simulation and the thing they're going to try to move all the souls into brand new simulation coming up so from their perspective Let's, they don't come from outside the simulation. There's no home for the archons to go to. The simulation is the only thing that exists for them. If the simulation ends, they end. 
So they have to keep the simulation going. They have to keep the power sources going. They have to keep the lies and deception going because if everyone figures it out, we end the simulation and we all go home. They don't. So if we see it that way, you can actually get a better understanding, I think, of what's going what's going on and why they're getting so hard because right now we're in the break point, I think. We're not in the old simulation anymore, but we're not in the new one yet. We're in this sort of middle ground. And that means the doorway out is as wide open as it's ever going to be. The, this, is the, this is actually the greatest opportunity, I think, that all of us as Divine Sparks have right now is that maybe hasn't been, well, hasn't been here since the last time this happened. If we, and I think that's why so much of this is being talked about now, it's like, if you do your work now, seriously, if you really spiral in, if you really ask the deep questions, if you go into philosophic work, if you, and, and, and act, like we said, you have to actually, there's things you actually have to do. You can't just think your way out of here. You have to do things, but you can build the right, we'll call it vessel that can actually go through the doorway because they, they're changing. They're not getting the energy that they need. That's why they're building a new simulation. If you think of it this way, if I'm here and the simulation is here, every time they draw energy from me, you lose some because it'll get dispersed in the movement. The best way then is, well, I could either create more beings to create more energy or I just do this. I put the simulation and the being together. In a sense, transhumanism. We make them a machine because if now I'm the machine, there's no energy loss. Everything can kind of still continue with no energy loss. And I think that's what's going on. It, it, it looks like one thing is, is being uh, put through here, but it, I think it's something else completely. And well, maybe I, that helps I must explain jump in what's here, going on. Howdy. Yeah, please. So, so AI uh, will capture or absorb or encapsulate or snatch your soul in a way. Is that is that what you mean? So that all of these souls will go into this AI super brain computer and be steered directly from that or be well absorbed by it or what be part okay of it. again yeah so my opinion again i think there's a few possibilities that could happen one is the majority of souls will not be in the simulation okay let's start so there's a there's a percentage of souls that we'll, I'm call, we'll call them soul we'll call them divine sparks divine spark a soul is something completely different but the divine sparks who will find their doorway who will have done what they feel they need to do and will be able to and will have navigate they've learned they've learned the navigation principle and they'll return home and if the system knows it might lose one percent of the whole what we call human population it might go a majority is going to be moved into the new simulation so i think when people are dying now i don't think they're reincarnating back into the simulation at all i think they're kind of going into a holding pen and they're waiting for the next and literally the thing we've known in our current run through of simulation of how the reincarnation cycle works i think that's over and i think a whole brand new one is being built for the new simulation which is much more uh, even more ai connected yeah even deeper so I you don't think that the whole tunnel of light uh, and the karma wheel, the fourth dimension, heaven, heavenly realm, possibly a deception, is um, functioning in the same way anymore? But you, we Why also not? said that the whole thing was probably AI steered anyway or created right. by AI. So what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, but my sense is that I get is that because they've, they've brought out this idea of 5D for a long time, we're moving into a 5D ascension. This has been, this has come out quite a bit. And I think that that's going to be, that's another way of trapping other souls. Some souls will move into it for various reasons. But to me, D doesn't mean dimension as in higher. D means dimension as in depth. Like to me, I don't want to go from 3D to 4D to 5D. I'd want to go to 1D which would be oneness, which would be one step away from the totality of the original creation, right? So ah, to me, D would mean, huh? yeah, D means depth, deeper in the simulation. So to me, all it means is that when we talk about what AI is doing, AI would just be creating something that's even in a more thick, uh, if you think of it like just heaviness, well, it's really heavy in 3D. Actually, like, where's 4D? First of all, how come no one talks about 4D? But then, well, all of a sudden, you're in this 5D, 
and you're in, it'll be even thicker. I think it'll be even harder to get out. And but um, they're talking about so, ascension. They're talking about right. you know being lifted and going to another right. dimension, higher and more advanced, and obviously right. more beautiful. And that time is yep. time only exists under the fourth dimensional layer and can only manifest right. in our three dimensional on this three dimensional plane. So that right. must mean that that must mean going up and to ascend. Right? No, well, I think no, I think that will happen for the people who choose that because it, it'll be a choice. It, it, I'm sure there'll be these beings will for, for some for some who have been following this path would say, here's an op here's an option for you. What a wonderful choice. Why don't you go here? Sounds good. And probably for a while, They'll, they'll experience that. Do you but think like that's anything, also a new age deception? Mm, yeah. The whole ascension sure. thing with 4D, 5D, yeah. and so on. Yeah. I think it's all a deception. And even when we get to the, if someone said, what's the deepest part of the matrix? Well, I would say the void, which is a type of nirvana, which is, I, I think a nirvana paradise does exist. The void certainly does exist. I've experienced it myself. But the didn't somebody is, say that, that even nirvana is also um a, 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 a construct in a way and also this right. part of the deception yeah no explain why so when you're in the, when someone is in the void they're having an experience usually they'll say i'm there's an experience of nothingness often what they say some will say i'm experiencing nothing and everything but generally the, the answer is i'm i'm experiencing nothing there's a there's an experience of, of nothing which is which is full and they're missing the for that to be said there has to be an experiencer and something you're experiencing that's duality so even when there can be an experience no matter no matter how beautiful or wonderful total the experience it's still in the matrix and so to me that's again it's the deepest part if if, if someone had to ask me where should i go after i die if you can get to the void great super place to go because it's going to give you a chance to take a little break and really potentially uh, look look around, but the trick would how, how be will you get to the void? Home. How will you get to the void? How um, and and and, mm. and is that actually the place to go? Is that what somebody has described as those cheese holes? And you turn around when you see the tunnel of light. You don't go into it, and you look out to the bleak darkness, and then you decide where you want to go. But you have to know where to go yeah. and to go in the right direction. And who says that that is the right direction? Not part of the well, the deception as well. Exactly. It's I, I think as someone's like when people ask me, well, what would you recommend if like all of a sudden someone's dead? What would you recommend? My recommendation is always just do nothing for a while. Just be still. You're it's a very confusing state. It's a very unknown state. So don't go into the white light. Don't go into the void necessarily. Don't go just just so you can just stay time. in that position of well, your soul leave when your soul leave the body. Mm -hmm. And you're you're dead, and you see probably everything. You see where you are in your bo bodily form and people you knew, but you leave that realm, and then you know you're dead. So what happens? You go to some place. It's dark, or what is it? And then suddenly the tunnel of light appears. Or do you go directly? Do they also hijack that? Uh, that? the 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 archons jinns whatever so that you go directly into that tunnel and then go into that that realm that you can't even well get out of that as well is that are we hijacked in that way also yeah possibly again i, I mean i haven't had that kind of near death experience personally my death experience was a little different i've certainly read a lot of near death experiences i've certainly you know read a lot of texts i've listened to what the people have talked to me over the years i have some ideas but it's all just an idea again we have to be worried because they've all been near-death experiences they've all come back so we don't know if a near-death experience is completely different than a real death experience is going to be or could what a near-death to... experience be a chemical reaction in the brain that could be explained um in a fish a lot in a physical way i mean i guess uh, doctors and you know scientists might do that in that way and we would explain it differently but do you think that that sensation 
that happens that kind of create the same kind of experiences often you know so many near-death experiences have come back and said they saw kind of the same thing depending on yeah. what religion they had and if it was jesus or allah or muhammad or whatever buddha yeah. whatever they saw yeah it's uh well one we we see that it's very similar to the dream state so it has the same a lot of the same elements as as being in a dream. So I think that's why also lucid dreaming can be a very powerful practice for people to start getting used to be aware to being in a non-physical realm and not what you're used to. What the near death experiences do tend to bring to us because we have like you say 80 or 80 to 85 percent of them are very similar. The white light, the life review, dead grandma, dead Jesus, wonderful feelings of love. Um, you know, and then usually being told it's not your time, time to come back. And But we have 15% that are very different, that are much darker and are much more, I think, revealing. And often in those 15%, they're indicating that the white light started or dead grandma was there and then the mask came off and they found out that was not what's going on. They're, they've been, they're being tricked and that, that the whole thing is some sort of deception. And what it seems like is whatever is going to, whatever's happening in that after death realm is like being uh, manufactured just for us. It's a particular place that will either, if they feel we need comfort, they're going to build that comfort. If they're going to build curiosity, they'll build, build that curiosity. If they're going to build fear, they're going to build the exact fear that's built for us. So again, I think that's an important, by understanding at least that part of it, that likely possibility we can begin to work with that now and saying, well, what are my biggest desires? What are my biggest fears? Because if I don't work through them now, they're going to come back to me then when I may have way less. Um, if, if it's in the astral realm, you have, tend to have seemingly have less access to logical functioning. It's a very emotional place and you'll be reacting very emotional again if you're not prepared for it. So how can we be preparing for all of these things now? And, the best answer I can try to give is by having more experience of being in a non-physical state where then you can just kind of be in a place of like, stop all of it, get away, leave me alone for a while and just take your time. Because to me, if the white light really is, as some like to say, the most beautiful, wondrous, caring thing in the world, it's what you should do. If it really is that, it'll wait a thousand years for you. It'll, it'll gladly wait a thousand years for you to make your choice and go to it. So to me, it's like, don't rush into anything if possible. Learn how can you learn to stay as cognizant as you can to get a, a, an assessment of the new reality that you're experiencing so that you can make the choice that's right for you, right? I could never say what would be right for anybody else. I could never recommend what they should do. It's just get to the point where if whatever choice you make, you if you look back on it a thousand years from now, you can say, yeah, in that moment, that really is what I wanted to do. So can you like um, compare it to, to our addictions here? We're all addicted mm -hmm. to something, whether it's sugar or um, I don't know, great experiences. Some people are addicted to alcohol or sex even. I mean, it's a, so when you see that and you get, get that sensation, that feeling of bliss when you leave the body, you want to maybe jump into that. You know, you want to be part of that. You want to have that sensation like what we're experiencing now. We all, we always want to go in, in the direction of, having a good time, feeling good. We would never go in the other direction, feeling bad, right? So, I mean, it. Yeah. so you have to let go of some of those addictions while you are on this planet to understand how you steer yourself at the point of death, I would expect. Yeah, it's a really good example of why I was looking forward to the conversation because these are really great topics of conversation. I think really, really important that often don't come up in my interviews. So I'm really appreciative of them and um right. if we think of yeah the average human is is suffering from or we know they're suffering from pain in in various forms aloneness is a big one people are constantly doing things because of how alone we feel and then there's trauma and what i think one a, a friend of mine now norio kushi um who who also talks on a lot of these subjects he discusses that there's all of us have an underlying fundamental trauma and that trauma isn't even from 
this life we've lived. It's like literally it's a part of our entire makeup. The Like the original soul that we, at our deepest core, has trauma as part of its foundation. So when you figure trauma is at the core of our foundation, if you have an experience that blasts the most, as it's described, the most beautiful, wonderful love you could ever imagine, when that's a, when our core has this trauma and aloneness, it's like 99%. You're just going to be like a magnet, just like a moth, just sucked into it because it's like, I've been waiting for something like this my whole experience. This is what I've this is what I've been searching my life for. And here it is until you get to a certain point. And then it's like, well, it's turned off. We got what we want now. We got your energy and you're back in and you're going to do it again. I mean, um, if you because, can't even say no to chocolate or or maybe another drink or the neighbor's wife. I mean, how how can you say no to go in, into that beautiful yeah. state of magnetism that that you're talking about? Right. I mean, it would take an exactly. enormous amount of discipline that most of us don't have, and uh, so it's it's really educational to discuss this yes. topic because if this is what is happening there, and it, we're not supposed to go in there, I mean, some people would probably say. I should go in there. It's supposed to be like that. It's wonderful. Yeah. I'll enjoy it. But uh, what is the dark aspect of going into that tunnel of light? And what is the good aspect of turning around and going to where? Yeah. The, the, so there's one going to where, but we'll say at least as I've come to feel this out now, that the tunnel of light or however that's going to be sometimes it's presented as a stairway it's presented in many different ways but it's just it's usually just something beautiful and wonderful it's drawing you it's the it's it's a it's a type of acceptance it's a type of contract that you make where you're in one way or another agreeing to move back into a new simulation you're agreeing to come back into a simulation and and uh what will happen and this is very clear is that one of the main things will be a memory wipe because one of the key elements that right away when I started writing this book was the realization when I finally realized reincarnation is probably 99% true. There's just too many verified experiences, particularly of young children who have these memories that they just, they're so verified. They, they can't, they can't be making it up. And as you begin to recognize, well, if this is a school, if this is a place of learning, then one of the most important pieces of learning is memory. You have to, you know, if I have to go and touch a stove every morning and burn my hand to find out that it's hot, well, that's insane. Memory tells you, I did that yesterday, that hurt, don't do that today, and I move on. And as we move through, supposedly, we should have had hundreds of lifetimes. And in fact, I believe we also have millions of lifetimes as ourselves. I just don't believe we reincarnate as different individuals. I believe I've had experiences where I've had multi seen multiple lives of myself, which would make sense that if you need experiences, why would you have one of me? You would have 10 million of me having every possible experience that can happen. So if you're going so through that all means of this that stuff, you have lived in, in the shape of howdy Howard mm -hmm. uh, many mm -hmm. times. And it wasn't just right. a new, a new body that you inhabited. Uh, the soul went yeah. into that during the whole karma wheel thing and reincarnation cycle. Right. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's parallel, like some would call them their parallel and they're all happening simultaneously, or if it's some kind of loop, that's quite possible too. What do you but think? I do know that what, what do you what do you think? What do you feel? That there are many parallel universes here that we're living in a multiverse. This is even where science is is going now. I mean, it has been for a yeah. long time. And you know, some people say that we can jump from one timeline to another, another frequency it's just another vibrating on another frequency. Yeah, again, one of my many experiences, it started with a different death experience is where I watched myself die in another reality, where me, the me I'm seeing here, and I saw myself die, and knowing that was a real death that happened at that exact time, but somewhere else. And as I began, tra and I began tracking other lives, and as I began tracking some of them, I got, I could see what jobs I had, what careers I had, who I married, what, and they were always things that were quite logical. Knowing my life, it's like, yeah, if I just made this turn here, if I talked to this woman a little differently, if I that that would that totally could have could have happened. And I don't know if you have these experiences, but since we're on the subject, but where you get up from a dream at night 
and you realize, oh, I dreamt about that experience from 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, that was really wild. And then you go on a little bit and you, wait a minute, I'm not sure that happened. And you begin wondering and questioning and maybe you look in your photo album and it's like, well, no, I wasn't actually, I don't have a photo of this place, but I know what happened. I know this experience. And you might even call a friend. Hey, do you remember when we went? What are you talking about? No, no, that time we went, I don't know what you're talking about. But you know deep down, and so I think that's what you're saying. It's like bleeding between various realities, various versions of ourselves, particularly when we dream, often bleed through. So we'll be having real experiences of us in a different, let's say, parallel universe that's it's it's real it's happening to the thing like i am individually but it didn't happen to the thing that we're talking to right here so could the multiverse yeah. with maybe countless of well or an infinite number of parallel universes be in that one simulation what i what i refer to as a folder mm. on the desk desktop so it is part of that simulation and there are many parallels of that simulation or are we talking about other simulations that are parallel universes in that way and we also exist there i would think both i would think both are pro that's just how vast i think this thing is because I talked about, you know, when, when I think the simulation ends, some will leave, some are going into the 5D simulation, some are going to get looped back into this one. However far back the simulation, they'll, they'll I think they're going to restart it and do this one more time. So I think all are possibilities for what could happen. Uh, and it and, and makes it interesting because it's like, well, say I'm going to awaken, I'm going to leave the matrix. Well, there's 10 million me's. So... Is it just one of us has to actually come to all this knowledge? And you might say the parts of the totality that I think of as me all leave at once. Or it also makes it interesting because it, it drops a bit of the egoic structure where it's easy to say, look how advanced I am. But look look at them. They're, they're, they're so unknowing. They're so below. But in another simulation, in another run through this, I guarantee you, I'm not talking anything about this at all. I'm living a very simplistic life. Maybe I never gave up my drinking. You know, I'm just, I'm being a bit of an idiot. So there's idiot versions of me. All I know, all I know is there's this version that is working very, very hard to understand the totality of creation and the totality of the self. And I'm going to have to trust that um, the most important thing to me, which is returning home, returning back to the original oneness, that I have to feel that whatever fragmented parts of the total self exist in the in the multiverse the many fragments that they will they will all they will all come together at some point if um if i walk the journey the way it's meant to be walked and will eventually and will make the return home and i think that's that's kind of how i feel about it and i can't prove it um i know again richard rose was very clear about this somebody asked well how do you how do you go about this and the simplest answer he gave, which is actually deep, was look for false and get rid of it. Drop it. Keep moving. Find more false. Drop it. Eventually, you will come to one thing that no matter how you try to drop, how you try to make false, you won't be able to. That will be the truth. So it's interesting that instead of trying to go towards what you think the truth is, you're actually walking backwards symbolically into deeper and deeper levels of yourself. And you do that by releasing more and more things that are untrue. Actually, that's the path. If anybody is doing that, you're walking the path. It's just a matter of time as to how far you will eventually reach that which you are. Yeah, and, and that, uh, you, you've also, this is a quote from you, anyone who says they know for certain what happens after we die, or how and why this universe was created, is lying. And uh, you could also say that about uh, truth re research in a way, you know, in when, when, when we awaken, we have our massive awakening and everything is turned upside down and our whole world crumbles and we have to build everything up again and try to live amongst everybody else who's on a different path and find new people who understand what we're talking about. You still, uh, you feel you now know so much that you didn't know before, and you you gain more and more access to uh, esoteric and spiritual and and let's say um, earthly knowledge. And then suddenly you think you know so much. And after a while, when you've been through this for a long time, you understand 
that you don't know very much at all. So everything you're talking about, about moving backwards, not not towards, towards the truth in a way, it makes a lot of sense because then it all comes down and boils down to what how you work on yourself within and not so much outside and everybody you know looking out there to to see what is going on being aggressive and negative always about uh, everything around you which will bring your energy down because that could take your whole day every day huh yeah and and i like you say i Whatever I feel comfortable in what I'm sharing and knowing, I know tomorrow I could have a completely different experience. Somebody could bring me something and I'm comfortable changing everything. Uh, I've changed everything in my life many times over the years and I'm always comfortable that it could very well happen tomorrow. And that's also an important part of the process is being comfortable with what you see and what where you are and what you feel like sharing without trying to force it on anyone and also knowing but i'm ready to hear something more that i don't know i'm ready to hear from somebody else who's maybe two steps higher than me um because that's i i'm interested because i really want to know um so all of that is an important part of the process is being comfortable like you say not knowing but being okay with the knowing that you think you might have not like uh, it's easy to then just say, well, I don't know anything. I can't say anything. I can't help anybody. Everybody has the ability to help somebody. There's somebody out there right now who what you have to say about anything, even if it's like like me back when I stopped drinking, helping somebody else who's still drinking and share my experience, that could help them immensely in their life. You have something that you can share, even if it's, it's small. We all have these little values and it's something we can do to that's another thing I try to talk about is being a value some way to the world. Just and it's small, just little things. How can you how can you make something better today than it was yesterday? And and, and that makes you move on, I think. Yeah, exactly. And what do you think about religions? Do you think that they were they're all the same because they have the same end goal? And they were created in a in a structured in a way like the Hegelian dialectic, divide and conquer, which is what we see all over the world, which is happening all in the in the within the political system and and well everything racial and sexual identity and everything. It's always about dividing and well splitting people, divide and conquer, right? That strategy, that tech, that tactic there. So Christianity, Islam. Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of that. They all want they all have the same end goal, right? To go to their source, to their so-called heavenly realm and meet their uh prophet or, or god or, or whatever is their their deity, which lead which is is leading us back to the whole reincarnation, recycling, karma wheel, soul trap frequency deception i i get the sense because when you do dig through religions there seems to be truth at the core of a lot of them so there does seem to be valuable information in there so originally a long time ago in previous simulations there was probably something in all of them but like anything over time it only takes one generation for everything to start getting twisted around and particularly if it's if it had too much truth in a sense, the AI itself will come in and start manipulating it as well. So when we pick up something like that, we have to realize we're dealing with something that's been altered so many times by so many people, by so many entities, It's but it's not complete garbage either. There is useful things in it. So if you're digging through whatever it is, what's valuable, you have to get a really good uh, knowledge meter of what's valuable and I can use, what's the stuff I can let go of. There's a lot because of symbolism I, I certain... written in the in the Bible yeah. and all of the all of the yeah. the religious scriptures. A lot of truth right. and a lot of hidden knowledge that you had to right. decipher and decode once you read it, because maybe people wouldn't understand yeah. the truth. But I'm just talking about that end goal, that same thing that they all want you to do when you are a heavy believer and you were indoctrinated through mind control techniques, which is which it really is, um, to eventually go to that heavenly realm, which we talk about, that that 
thing that might have been created by the Archons to get you to go back into a new body with a wiped memory, not being able to remember anything, then go through a whole life of suffering again. Wouldn't you say that that is I guess the, the, the question, goal of the all question, of them? The question everybody would have to ask is, who is the creator that they really want you to meet? Who is the one they are directing you to? Is it through the all creator, the one who created the original, or is it the Demiurge? The one who's created the demiurge, the devil. Yeah. yeah. Or I guess the I guess a better word might be because I, I get a sense like the the what the what the demi one of the first things the demiurge seemed to do was in the creation of duality created the light and the dark, right? Created the good and the bad, separated the waters, and bizarrely the archons will eat good energy as well as bad energy they're interested in energy and so one of the great goals to me is our soul is really something from outside the matrix this divine spark something from inside the matrix energy that's put together and that's what begins the process of adding bodies and bodies and getting bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper in, in the simulation what is inside that matrix is that our um solar system or the or the the whole universe i mean well there are people now who believe in flat earth and then it's different with a dome and then everybody who believes in the globe earth form and on all of the other planetary systems and all of that i mean but it's still in a matrix right it's still kind of in that and also the people who are into flat earth, they believe that we're enslaved under that dome, basically, right? And it's difficult to get through that, whatever they call a hole on top of the dome, or isn't that, I, I, do I understand it correctly? Yeah. I think so, yeah. All of it is um, different, I guess, viewpoints of explaining false. That's the easiest way. The matrix is false. The matrix is is a deception. So a could, the, could the matrix or the AI have created a flat Earth version and a globe Earth ver version or something in between? Yep. I guess the it's, people ask me this all the time. You know, what do you believe? And it's like, uh, what's interesting because you could prove the Earth is a globe. You could prove the Earth is flat. You could prove the Earth is not a globe. You can prove the Earth is not flat. I think the answer is something else. And it it presents itself, everything presents itself in such a way that you can argue uh, a position forever as long as it's not truth. This is a great one for the conspiracy theorists out there, which I think is an important uh, thing to do. It's not a bad label to put on anybody. It just means you're thinking about reality. But when I watch like standard events that go on here in the Matrix, when something happens, the mainstream media will put out, here's the answer, here's what just happened. And we know that's wrong. They seem to influence the conspiracy theorists to put out another particular theory, but that will also be wrong. So I know whatever comes out first from the conspiracy theory side, that's also wrong. And it's just designed to create battle between the two. And actually what it does is it keeps the original narrative going. Like JFK was killed by uh, 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 Lee Harvey Oswald. Others said, no, he was killed by the CIA. No, he was killed by the mafia. No, he was killed by... No one then asked the third question, well, okay, how do we know he's dead? Exactly. How do we, how do we actually know he got killed? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that be question number one? How do we prove that first? And if we could prove that, then we could... So that's what I see the Matrix does constantly. It's just what I said before, the, the Hegelian dialectic divide yep. and conquer splitting it yep. happens all the time the truth movement yep. were yep. there two planes were they holograms was it do right. that took down the uh, towers along with nano thermite and you know i mean it's been it's been it, it, dividing the truth movement no matter what we're talking about and it yeah. continues as the world is expanding and we have more yep. madness or, or you know it's and the last and it's, three years and it's started. good for a while you know i i always reckon it's good for a while to ask these questions and to dig for a while and at least just see standard narratives it doesn't matter whether it's history science religion philosophy it's just they're not true okay but like you say then there comes a point where you could just keep doing that 
And that's what the matrix wants. It wants you to just keep following that road constantly rather than step back and start saying, okay, I know that's false. I don't need to know exactly what's true or exactly how it's structured. I need to go what's deeper. What's the next step still stru- uh, stuck w- within this yeah. little matrix they've created for themselves and their own narrative. Yeah. And then there's a lot of infighting which you see constantly in this truth movement as well, and people calling each other controlled opposition and whatnot. I mean, there's a lot of paranoia and a lot of madness going on uh, in that circle as well. So it's uh, it's brilliant for the elitists, right? The system is doing exactly what it's designed to do. In, in uh, Gnostic terminology, the word cosmos means system. That's really what it means. And if we think of it in computer terminology, it's just the entire makeup of this place. And it's, and you can, you can dig into Plato's cave. You can learn more of how this place operates, how it's functioned, things you can do to improve yourself a little bit and whatnot, you know. But the problem is, is we've seen over, especially the last 50 years, the biggest moneymaker has been how to turn your thoughts and wishes into manifested reality, how to get what you want, how to have the, the experience you want, never stepping back and saying, but wait a minute, even if I get it, it's false. Even if I get it, it's not going to be the totality of the true power within me, whatever that is. Why don't I go just find that? Maybe it's good while you're here to use the law of attraction, which clearly works. If you want a better life and you want a better situation for your family or something, I mean, then, you know, it's not since we do have the monetary system, then how can we navigate in this when we are under that rule i mean it's a it's a it's a a dominance right we have to make a living and we have to work hard for small money it's it's organized slavery yeah i I never said like any of this stuff is like bad you know like i i'm happy that when if my stomach is sore i know what herbs to have to be able to uh, alleviate that i'm glad to know what acupressure points to push that will move the energy a different way but i still know but that's still about uh, the artificial being that I thought I was before the death experience in the artificial world. And it's important that it's important from the standpoint of the easier you can function in this reality, the more you have control of the energy and you're not wasting it, then it can be put to other things. If you don't have the energy available, you can't use it, if that makes sense to everybody. When people talk about yoga and qigong, those are very powerful practices but not if you're doing them to look better or just to, um, you know, be a little more balanced and healthy. That's great. But really, those are practices like of Taoist alchemy, for example, in Qigong, which is designed to store this energy. And then with that stored energy, you take it into the deepest part of your chemical transformation, which is finding the totality of your true inner goal, right? The true inner self. So it, it's a, it's about, and also all of these things, which the, the easier you function here, the more you can not be stressed out and not be dealing with every single problem in your world. That's potential energy you can use. Then it becomes a question of, well, now don't waste it. Because that's a lot of people do that. They do a good job. They'll store some energy. And then the next day they waste it. And they're back to where they started from. And then to and understand that you have step. to move away from consumerism and materialism and to know that there, there there are energies you have to work on a lot more obviously i guess a lot of people yeah. do know that in the uh, in, in in this world even though we have to navigate you know how to 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 be on this plane while we're we're still here but uh, we're talking about this great reset and the world is dividing and they are you know they want to create this great reset and perhaps it's not altogether a bad thing because we do want the old system to fall right we don't want to be part of that but what's going to happen do you think you say that they will uh, well it will do a grand reset in the way that they will smash this simulation or what or do we jump on a different timeline? Or do we, who are in this world of understanding other things, do we stay on this plane? Or what do you what do you suspect or think is going to happen in the coming years? Yeah, again, the feeling would be, and it's going to be very soon. We're not that far away. It's very, very soon <clears throat> to what's going to happen. 
my guess is, is it's going to get more and more difficult, more and more crazy. I mean, whatever people think crazy, you haven't seen it yet. It's coming. As all of this begins to lose its stability, you might say it's it's literally going to be like a shaking experience of the whole the whole simulation. I guess it'd be just the same. What happens at the end of a video game? Like if we were, if you were a character in a video game, and the video game came to the end, there's no more. There's nothing else that can happen. What what would happen to the character? Well, the character might go back. The person might push end, restart. The game starts again. And the characters back on the streets, walking down the street like they did when the game started. That's one distinct possibility for some that literally it'll just you'll just you might go back to like 1746. Boom, there you are. Not even knowing that anything has changed. You might just you'd be here one day, it's January, it's, it's you know, it's February the first, uh, this year, 2024, and then all of a sudden it's February 2nd, 1742. And you have no memory. That's possible. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. Really? Some will... Do you think so? That sounds incredible. Sure. But I mean, you it's wouldn't possible. want to live for the next 40, 50 years in a fifteen-minute city, right? Uh, due to climate lockdowns and whatever they can invent, which right? Which because they then, have... like we talked about, you're you're giving up you're giving up uh, your relative freedom. And again, it's all about what's the deepest goal. So if the goal is ultimate freedom and ultimate knowledge, then the things that you are experiencing in this realm have to be uh, mirroring that inner search. So yeah, would would any of those things be like, I can't tell anyone else what to do, right? Like, you know, but I can, me, no, I'm not interested. Just not interested, not doing it. So uh, what will that mean as you go forward? Things will probably get very, very difficult. Now, as the simulation ends, I'm sure there will be various ways of trying to move people into the simulation. There might be things that are very physically oriented. You know, it could be, it could be as simple as um, the planet is dying, and uh, well, luckily we have some spaceships ready. And why don't you just board these, and we'll take you to another planet where you'll be safe. And as you go on the spaceship, uh, and it shakes a little bit, and then you have a little blackout session, and when you come to, you're in. You're in the new simulation and you didn't even know. And you land on the planet and you think you've just gone from Earth to somewhere else, but you've really you changed simulations. It could all be that subtle of the various ways this could this could happen. And so uh, the best thing to do is, I think, not is, is to not know, is to realize that we can't prepare for what this might be because we just can't, we have nothing in our standard memory bank that can really logically get us ready for what might be occurring here all we can do is be on a day-to-day -day basis and feel as connected as possible to the deepest thing we call us that will allow us to give us the information we need in the moment to know what we should do in that moment but how that can we break out of matter. the matrix eventually? How can we break away from this slave system? What do we do at the point of death when leaving the body, when the soul goes out to that whatever is right. there and you have to choose to go to where? To source, Godhead, God, energy, whatever. It, how, how do you break out and move out of this matrix so that we don't have to return if we can break out of it, if we're not uh, encapsulated here forever, which I do not know I would we say, are. I would say the one word that would be the, the direction marker would be remembering. That word comes up a lot in ancient texts, particularly in ancient Egypt. There's a big, a big amount of the whole process of Osiris and Horus is about the rememberment of Osiris. And I think it's about remembering that all of this is false. And remembering that there is truth somewhere. The problem is it's not here. Uh, I read a, a, a book. There's a book by a, a Greek woman, really, really good book. And she reminds that if you want to become a computer programmer, it's not a good idea to study pottery. So the same thing. If we want to return home, our study should be about what's outside the matrix and eventually have less study of what's inside the matrix. But so how do it's we like study this, what is outside like, make, make... of the matrix? How do we study that? And how, how do we come to the conclusion, oh, this is where I'm going? Like if you want to, 
you know, go to the, the Canary Islands or to uh, Costa Rica for a holiday? I mean, how do we know the destination? Right. Unfortunately, we don't. We can only, I sense, feel it out. And I think the the emotion that would help the most in that is nostalgia. We tend to have three very strong emotions, right? Usually, it's 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 uh, fear, uh, uh, like, a, like a seductive type thing, something you want to get something, and nostalgia, where we remember things from the past. And usually, we always remember our past in a nostalgic moment in a really nice way. And normally we don't, when we, if I, if we have a nostalgic memory of when we're eight years old and something nice happened to us, it's not like we really are trying to read. We don't want to be eight years old again. We're just, we're remembering the feeling. We're connecting with this place where we used to be, but we're not now, but it had this possibility. It had this potential. Something about that feeling is similar, I think, to the to the totality of outside the matrix. That that outside the matrix is that the, the 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 way we build nostalgia. That's another thing. If we build this nostalgic feeling in the dream here in this matrix, we're building the deeper nostalgia that will help us remember the outside of the matrix. So I can't say specifically because I think it will be the the remembrance of of the totality will be a little different for each person, and they each person is going to have to kind of get their own gauge of they've they've tapped into it they've really tapped into it now it's like but is there a good talk, yeah. version a good ma a version of this matrix you you said that this demiurge kind of hijacked uh this whole and all of these mm -hmm. souls that were trapped here but i mean do you, mm -hmm. if there's a good version of it people would probably want to go there i mean um uh, or break out but then what what's out there will we be absorbed and annulled by mm. uh, merging mm. with source with god mm. or that energy that universal power if we choose to go yeah. to that yeah i guess the best way to sort of keep that in mind is a lot of these ancient texts refer to this reality as a copy and that's why i, I use another reason i use the word simulation so it's not just it's not just built randomly. The simulation is is modeled on something else. And it seems like the thing that it's modeled on is, at least let's put it this way, not this insane. That there's some form of sanity in that original. Now, who knows? Now, that could be a copy of something else. And we may have to go back further maybe we have to go through another through that it's it's a copy of it's just a better copy it's a more clean copy but maybe it's not perfect either you know there may be layers of this to go through but knowing that the, that word is used again and it's used in the corpus hermeticum it's used in the nagamati documents when they say that this the whole matrix is a copy i think that gives us a little bit of hope to indicate then it's not just a random prison that's been built it's something it's something that was something else that was you might say twisted around and that's what's made made it into a type of prison <clears throat> and we'll know we were out when everything is turned around when everything is upside down compared to how we know it now then i think we've 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 moved out of one into the original talk about this sleep state because this is where a lot of people say we can begin as well when you are mm -hmm. sleeping lucid dreaming have you ever had the experience of being have being fearful of falling asleep or having a fear attack once you fall asleep or into a yes some kind of sleep sleeping situation actually more so what i would get in in my some of my experiences is i'm in the dream state <clears throat> and i'm non-lucid so i'm fully believing what's going on and there's somebody that i know particularly somebody from my past who is really close to me and the experience is going on. Of course, I'm drawn to them. I know them. I miss them. I get up after this dream and I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can barely move. My thoughts are awful. And I have to realize really quickly that wasn't who the person was in the dream. That was some sort of archonic being who was putting a mask on, drawing me in, and then you might say taking me for a ride in the, in the dream state. So for me... That's a perfect warm up to the possibility of what the after death state is going to be. So 
the more we can practice the state of being aware in our dream, because usually people will want to learn lucid dreaming because then I can make, I can start making whatever I want. I can make this building. I can do this. I can date this girl. I can get all this money. I can, it's like, actually it's to become so aware of your environment that you become a tremendous witness of it and you don't get pulled into anything that's going on. You, you, you generate a tremendous ability rather than to control a tremendous ability to witness and dissect what's happening in your, in your experience. Um, and then I think if we can hold on to that learning, that's something we take into these, these after death realms of this kind of total awareness where we're not, we're not pulled into anything. We're not, we're not dragged into it. We are, we are a witnessing awareness and we can then um, tap into that, which is our power and make the choices that we feel are right for us in the moment. I mean, why do you think a lot of people have sleeping disorders and sleeping problems? And that could be insomnia, like sleeplessness. It could be sleep apnea Why, when you don't, you know, you don't breathe during the, uh, <laughs> seances during the night for, for many seconds. Isn't it a strange thing right away to even ask, why do we sleep? I, I, they, they, it's almost should go back to like an original question. Never mind. Why do we dream? Why do we sleep? Uh, well, we need to recharge the body. Well, why is that the way we need to recharge the body? So to me right away, even though I don't have an answer, it indicates to me something odd is going on right away because you could have built this machine to not need sleep at all, right? You could have built it almost like a robot that it just keeps going and having. So something in the sleep state is wanted in the, in the makeup of the whole character. And my sense is it, is this somehow moving away from this particular constant uh, reality we experience and touching these other realities that there's something important that is built into us, whether it's for control purposes or it's for uh, possible opening purposes, I don't know, but it tells me it's been built in for a reason. And almost that should be our first question is, why do we sleep? And so if somebody's having a problem sleeping, then my question would have to return to, well, <clears throat> if we can figure out what sleep is, maybe we can figure out why we don't want to do it, what's blocking us. I'll give a little, maybe I'll a lot of I'll people are control freaks as well. Uh, how do you, I mean, and maybe it's this, maybe. we all know what we're doing when we're awake, when we're here, we, we, we know what to do. We know this three, three D, um, sure. uh, world we're living in, but when we go into the sleep state, we have to surrender and lose control. Yeah. And that could be a yeah. problem for millions and it's becoming increasingly worse for a lot of people, sure. maybe also due to all the electromagnetic frequencies and, and yeah. beams and all of that physical stuff. But your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. It sounds very plausible. Certainly very plausible. I went through a period of time where I couldn't sleep for about two weeks, like literally could not sleep and tried everything possible didn't work. I finally got a piece of advice from one of the medicine people that I know. And they said, well, you know, there's millions of other people right now who can't sleep and who are actually, they can't sleep because they're in trauma, they're in pain. They're, I mean, I was just, you know, I just had stress and I couldn't sleep, but there's people who can't sleep to chronic pain or trauma. And she said, why don't you, instead of wasting your time sleeping there, not sleeping, send out healing energy to people all over the world who can't sleep right now and could use some help. And I thought, what a great idea. So I did that the first night and I, I didn't sleep, but I, I felt better in the morning. I felt a little more energized. The second night I did it, I fell asleep. That's as a soon good as piece I started advice. giving, yeah, as soon as I started going, turning my attention away from me and what can I do for someone else, even though I'm having trouble, what can I do for someone else? The problem solved itself. Great. That's that. That's a good thing to think about. And your final thoughts for people: What should they do now? You, you, you don't have an answer to where where they should go at the point of death, and how could anybody? But we have to keep searching for this information. Uh, but what is your advice for people living on the planet right now during these very crucial, changing times? 
Mm. I guess the, the, the simplest thing is to ask yourself if you look in the mirror and you feel that you're a human being, which, okay, most of us probably do. I think to say, okay, if I'm going to live as a human being, what are the most important traits that make me human? What are the things that that are human? And then as we go, because this was something I did uh, in the last few years, every time a choice came, I just decided what's what would a, what would someone who's human do in this situation? How would the human being act? And then I just did that. And that might be one of the easiest ways to get through some of the crazy stuff that might be trying to throw at us. It's just, what does a human being do right now? I'll do that. And it also takes a lot of the stress and concern away because you don't have to think about anything. It just becomes, well, how does a human being act right now? Oh, the human being does this. There you go. Unfortunately, a lot of human beings, they just comply with what the system and their their controllers tell them because they allow them to be controllers. So that's probably not, not the to be way our to next go. conversation is how many human beings are really here. We can add that to the next conversation. Which I am looking forward to, and I think we will have another explosive one or two hours. And these two hours certainly went very, very fast. And uh, there were so many things we didn't get to cover at all. Also things that I prepared, but I think we really went to some wonderful and great places here. And I really enjoyed it. So let's uh, meet up soon for a part two. Howdy. And for now, I just want to say thank you so much for being on with us here and thank you for being on age of truth tv thank you so much for having me and uh, i appreciate it and um uh you know if people are interested in finding more of course i'm an author and the greatest way of supporting and saying thank you to an author is you know picking up one of their books so uh, you can always pop by amazon and see the titles that are there you don't have to buy them from there you can just see them there you can buy them just like we live here in scandinavia ad libris happily carries them all for example and um um yeah so and your website. my website is yeah, your yeah website. it's new now howdymccoskey.com you can go there most of my work now goes on to a locals channel so if you sign up to locals it's free to sign up to locals uh, i still have a youtube channel it still exists there's still 300 videos or something there you're welcome to track things back and that's a good place to start and see if something is interesting to you and again if it's just something that makes you think and makes you ask some questions and go deeper and maybe the next time if our world gets a little bit of sanity in the next while, like, like you, I think it's going to get crazy for a while, but if we get a little bit of sanity, maybe I'll come to Copenhagen and we can do this in person. That would be <laughs> just perfect, but I do think you should come anyway soon. You're very welcome. I would love to see you in person. It would be so great. It's not too far, so let's certainly make that happen. And again, yeah. Howdy, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having me, Lucas. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much to Howard Howdy Mikoski, and thanks to all of you for watching Age of Truth TV. You can support us by clicking onto our website, ageoftruth.tv. And please like our video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website, ageoftruth.tv as well. Please also subscribe to our alternative channels on BitChute and Brighton. Your support is greatly appreciated and very needed. And on behalf of the Age of Truth TV team, we thank you all for watching and we'll see you again soon.